Good evening. Uh, welcome back to the online seminar series Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. We have the pleasure today of having Katja Scheinberg. She's full professor at the School of Operations Research and Information Engineering at Cornell University. She has previously been at Lehigh University and uh, IBM. So um, Katja is a great contributor to the area of continuous optimization by developing uh, algorithms and providing theoretical analysis for them for various problems in complex optimization, derivative-free optimization, machine learning, quadratic programming, etc. She has ample uh, uh, editorial experience, so she is currently editor-in-chief of the Mathematics of Operations Research Journal, and she has been in the past from uh, the Mathematical Programming Journal. Her research is supported by um, uh, very well-known uh, research councils, uh, such as NSF, uh, but also by DARPA and um, uh, other institutions. We are very pleased to have you today um, Katja, and the floor is yours for the audience so that you know it's uh, business as usual. We, we will have the questions towards the end, but uh, Katja has uh, agreed also to stop on the way and check uh, whether there are any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, yes, please stop me if something is going wrong uh, with my slides or my audio or whatever. And um, it's unfortunate I don't see uh, the audience well, but or at all, but I did see the names popping up and I see a lot of old friends, so this sounds good. Um, and yeah, thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so this talk uh, basically is more about, um, you know, posing questions rather than giving answers in some sense. And I think the time is ripe for us to uh, kind of discuss things a little bit beyond what is standard now in stochastic optimization. And um, I'll, you know, basically be talking about what I'm thinking about going forward. And uh, so a lot of it is based on some partial work. Uh, some of it is based on already completed work, but, uh, but really it's more, as I said, questions rather than answers. And um, as you see from my title, Stochastic Oracles and Where to Find Them, it refers to basically J.K. Rowling books on Harry Potter and the like. And I will be going through some um, stochastic or fantastic beasts um, later in the talk. But first, uh, let's do a very basic setup. Although I think, you know, from what I've seen in the audience, nobody here probably needs this introduction. But um, so a gradient descent is a is a kind of the core basic algorithm that we all know and love. And um, what a gradient descent does is taking steady steps down the slope of a function surface. Um, and you know, here I have a picture basically that indicates exactly that steady progress towards descent or along the descent direction. And this is what we get when we know exact gradients. Now we know that you can improve the behavior of gradient descent by using some kind of curvature information, but this is not uh, mostly what um, uh, I'll be talking about, although it will have some bearings of, on what we want to do. Um, now, these days we are facing uh, more and more, we're facing functions for which we cannot compute the gradient. Um, and there are different various reasons for that. Um, and we can usually only approximate the gradient. And, you know, for years I've been working in the derivative free optimization world where we couldn't compute the gradients because the functions were black box. So they, we just didn't know how to even deal with them. But now more and more functions are not exactly black box, but nevertheless, they still have give us trouble. Uh, for example, if the function can be an expectation over some distribution, in which case we can only sample the gradient, but we cannot compute it accurately. In some cases, we cannot compute the function, we can only compute some approximation of it. So uh, what we will be assuming is the function itself is nice, L-smooth, nonlinear, possibly non-convex. Uh, however, we have only some approximations of it that we, we can compute. And we will be discussing precisely what is it that we want from these approximations. So 
traditionally so far a lot of work has been focused on very specific assumptions on what this um, uh, what these approximations are like. So, for example, uh, in expectation, uh, you basically your you have unbiased uh, gradient um, and function estimates, right? Uh, so let me actually use this wonderful feature of having a pen. So here are the um, assumptions that are most commonly made, especially in modern machine learning applications. But uh, and this is basically says I have unbiased estimate of the gradient, I have an unbiased estimate of the function value. Moreover, the, uh, they're actually connected. So uh, basically one sample function value that I compute gives me a function whose gradient gives me the sample gradient estimation. This is what we do in machine learning usually. This is not always the case though. It's not uh, necessarily, um, uh, you know, in mo many applications, not necessarily the case, and this is what we'll be talking about, right? So how do we uh, consider other assumptions? Okay, uh, so when we don't have exact gradient information, things don't look necessarily as nice, right? For example, here I have just this for illustration showing the algorithm that is stochastic gradient descent, which just as an algorithm is exactly the same as the gradient descent, we just take steps along the direction of negative gradient, except for the, the, the instead of gradient, we have some approximation of it. And this approximation may be good in expectation, but otherwise doesn't have to be accurate. And so we can be basically moving around all over the place. But the idea that somehow we would tend to be going in the descent direction eventually. OK. To the next one. So. What is it that we basically hope to have and want to have from the gradient estimate? So there, in exact gradient estimates have been explored for quite a while and not just with stochastic versions. And if we have an exact gradient descent, uh, we may basically may not have the exact gradient direction, but we're hoping to get something like it. And I'll quantify it, you know, to some degree in, in just the next slide. So I am taking steps that are like the gradient, but doesn't have to be exactly gradient. And in that case, I can actually make steps that are sufficiently large. So the gradient descent in general is all about the step size selection. We know that we can use step size selection using line search and some other methods. And this is very, very practical and important. Uh, but in theory, basically, we know that if my function is all smooth, then this the gradient descent will work with the um, uh, step size parameter being ab about 1 over L, and L being the Lipschitz smooth constant. So we can, I will call this large steps. Now, L can be large in which case the step size are small, but still they're large step compared to the stochastic gradient descent, where we cannot take these steps anymore. We have to actually drive step size parameter to zero. And that is because we basically, we no longer have uh, the sufficient accuracy in the gradient. We have accuracy in the gradient only in expectation. And if we drive these gradients to zero, with step size to, to zero, we have to also do it at a certain rate. And that also is something that is, um, you know, the behavior of the algorithm is very sensitive to that. So here is a little bit more detail on the same uh, thing. So we have on the left, uh, we have uh, different conditions that the gradient approximation can satisfy which will be sufficient for us to take large steps. Now, G is still a stochastic gradient, right? But it, the requirement is that it is not too different from the true gradient with some sufficiently high probability. And not too different means that uh, it, it varies. It depends where we are in the algorithm. What is the current size of the gradient, let's say? So if the current gradient is large, then the difference between the estimate and the true gradient doesn't have to be very small. 
it can be basically needs to be proportional. And as the gradient gets smaller, we need to get more and more accurate. And again, this has to be with some fixed probability. So as you can imagine, I mean, this is a concentration bound on the gradient estimate, essentially, but it can be derived, <clears throat> and we'll talk about it, from a variance bound. So here we care about the variance of the gradient estimate. On the right is uh, some condition for stochastic gradient uh, method without any, you know, well, it's not exactly not any strong assumption, but it basically it's a much weaker assumption on the gradient variance. So here we assume that the gradient is unbiased or approximately unbiased estimate of the true uh, function of the true gradient. And the uh, variance between the gradient estimate and the gradient is bounded by these two numbers here. So these two numbers are they're important. Uh, one of them is uh, just the variance, which does not go to zero as a gradient goes to zero. And this term goes to zero as gradient goes to zero, but it also is, it gets larger as gradient gets larger. This is a fairly normal and general assumption on the gradient <clears throat> variance. And what happens here is that um, if MC is not zero, so the variance of the gradient does not go to zero as we con converge to a solution. Then the only way to converge is to basically drive alpha k to zero. The size has to get smaller and smaller. If MC happens to be zero or something quite small, so negligible, let's say, uh, then uh, we can do uh, st step sizes that are kind of finite and don't go to zero bounded away from zero, but they have to be 1 over LMB. And MB is this term up here, right? Uh, so basically, the larger the variance in the gradient, uh, the smaller the step size. And this is key in some sense, because so far, I think we are not looking sufficiently carefully at the total complexity of these methods in terms of including the variance of our gradient estimations. And the variance does immediately affect convergence rates. So again, if MV, if MC is positive, then alpha k goes to zero. And in fact, the convergence rate of stochastic gradient descent is slow. And if um, uh, MC is zero, but MV is not, then the uh, convergence of stochastic gradient descent is similar to that of the gradient descent, but it, the variance immediately affects the constant in that convergence rates directly, okay? So here, basically, I'm going to summarize the thoughts. Uh, so large variance results in smaller steps. Uh, moreover, it's uh, something that we need to actually usually tune. We don't know exactly what steps are good, so we have to try uh, try out different step sizes uh, for an algorithm for algorithms, and um, that costs a lot of effort. Uh, if, on the other hand, you do have more accurate gradient and function estimates, you can use line search, and then you can select step size automatically. You can also use things like LBFGS. So I said we won't care about it much, but second order information, if it can be used, can be used with more accurate gradients, but not with gradients with high variance. Um, and we also need function value estimates to be able to use line search, which stochastic gradient descent does not use. Um, and so essentially, there is a cost to trying to be more accurate, but there's also a benefit. Uh, and the benefit being that we can select the step size automatically, use second order information, and so on. Um, and what I'm trying to say is that this trade-off is not well understood so far. It is relatively maybe understood in some very specific cases of machine learning applications. But it's general, but even there, the assumption on the variance is usually very standard and, and kind of straightforward, but also not necessarily very correct, such as like variance in the gradient estimates is, say, bounded by a constant, which is not even uh, usually uh, the correct assumption. 
so these uh, trade-offs are not understood very well, usually. Okay. Uh, so what I'm basically trying to get at is that when we analyze stochastic gradient descent, uh, we know that there is iteration complexity analysis, how many iteration it takes uh, to converge to an epsilon optimal, op epsilon, op uh, epsilon optimal solution. Uh, and it's usually done on the assumption that per iteration complexity is fixed somehow. So the oracle that produces the gradient and maybe the function estimates is, is has a fixed cost. Uh, but uh, we, you know, that cost can actually uh, be analyzed, and the accuracy of these gradients can affect the convergence rates. And so the trade-off again between uh, these two will give us the total complexity analysis of stochastic gradient descent, which actually can depend on the environment where we're using the algorithm. Okay, so with that, uh, I am suggesting to essentially use uh, some kind of unified definition of stochastic oracles. So, uh, the, so this is the, what I'm proposing, but it have to be, of course, the only definition. This is just something that came out of the previous work we've been doing, and this is a handy definition. So the first, the zero sort of oracle is something that uh, approximates the function value up to some accuracy, right, with some fixed probability, or with at least some fixed sufficiently large probability. So given a pair delta zero and m zero, Oracle is guaranteeing to produce a first order, uh, the, the zero order approximation, so the function value approximation that is this accurate, so with M0, with this probability, right? And so the, the oracle will depend on the choice of the M0 and delta 0, and it will have a cost depending on what M0 and delta 0 are chosen. And it may or may not actually work for all choices of M0 and delta 0. So the possible choices of M0 and delta 0 for which this oracle is implementable belong to a set. So this oracle is implementable over a particular set. And I'm basically the rest of my talk, I'm going to talk about examples of these oracles that are familiar to probably many of you, and we, we, we shall see how they fit into the framework. Uh, the definition of first order oracle is exactly the same, except for now we have uh, basically the gradient estimate. Uh, it has to be accurate up to a given constant m1 with probability 1 minus delta 1. Okay, so here I uh, can basically pause for questions. <clears throat> Let me maybe go back to the previous slide in case people have any questions about this particular. Yes, so okay. Emmanuel has a question and we are going to give him uh, uh, the rights to uh, unmute. And... Hello, Katya. Always a pleasure to, to listen to your talks. My my question is is referring to a remark of yours uh, uh, contrasting inexact gradients with the stochastic gradient. So you at some point you mentioned concentration, uh -huh. and it looked as if you have you didn't didn't really bother about the bias. Ah. Okay. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. yeah. Variance. Variance somehow suggested to me that you have no bias in the expectations or, or a negligible bias. So ah, I was wondering. Okay. Very, very good. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. So, so finish. Yes. You were wondering what about bias? No, no. I was wondering the, about the role. What, what, what is your focus? So, so you want to have a mic, uh, mean variance or a bias variance balance or do you want to just look at the uh, the, inter uh, the MSE or is it just really that we don't have to think of bias, don't have to bother about bias? No, no, we, we absolutely have to bother about bias. This is actually my next slide here. Uh, everyone is a little bit biased. 
So, so right. So what I'm trying to exactly. So I'm trying to incorporate into these definitions uh, the concept of a bias as well. So if I go back to uh, this um, definition of oracles, uh, it precisely includes everything in it in, in, potentially. So if so, I'm, I'm talking about. Oracle being implementable over a particular set of M zeros and delta zeros, right? So if I don't have a bias in my estimate, then in principle, I may be able to implement uh, this Oracle for arbitrarily small M zero, because I can average more, for example, gradient or function estimates and get closer and closer to the true value because they're unbiased. So arbitrarily small M zero would work. but if I do have a bias, then M0 is bounded below by that bias. I cannot make it smaller. And that precisely would be incorporated in the definition of the oracle. And then the algorithmic analysis will depend on the smallest possible M0 or M1. And in fact, we did already analyze it in some um, methods that if you have a bias, essentially you just don't converge to the optimal solution because you can't, but you converge to a neighborhood of the optimal solution and you can directly tie the neighborhood of convergence to the bias, basically. The larger the bias, the, you know, the bigger the neighborhood and there's a direct formula as you can figure it out, I mean, basically figure out. Does that answer it? Thank you, yes. Okay, great. Yes, but but I mean, this is exactly the motivation that we kind of want to make sure because there is a lot of bias in many or not necessarily very large. I mean, if there's very large bias, we don't know what to do. But uh, if the bias is somehow under control to some degree, but it's there, we do want to incorporate that concept into analysis of algorithms. And um, we suggest to do it through the, um, uh, yeah, through basically you know, analyzing the, those oracles. Okay, so now, uh, sorry, are there more questions at this point? Okay, if not, uh, let's get to business in terms of um, actual oracles. So we start with the standard uh, empirical expected loss minimization, rather, expected loss minimization. We have um, the gradient, uh, sorry, the function phi is defined as expected value of the loss function. And the loss function is basically defined on the data and data comes from some distribution. And our gradient and function estimates come from basically a mini batch uh, approximation, right? So we have a B is the mini batch and uh, for this mini batch, we average all the loss functions and all their gradients and we get the uh, function gradient estimate. This is exactly what we do in, you know, very standard by now machine learning setting. And here comes our first fantastic beast. So each of these oracles I'm going to try to assign a beast and um, it's, it's a very sort of per personal choices. So you may not agree with that, but uh, so this is a hippogriff, and if you're familiar with the Harry Potter series, hippogriffs are these kind of wonderful magical creatures um, that have to be approached with respect. If you approach them with respect and carefully, then you can get a lot out of them, but otherwise you have to be careful because they can bite you. And that's essentially the um, how I would like to view the classical expected risk minimization. Okay, so uh, the next one is, oh, sorry, sorry, yes. Uh, now, how do we actually put it in the, um, in the framework of the Oracle? I just suggested, well, this is pretty easy. So we, if we have some kind of assumption such as uh, the standard assumption from, for example, um, Curtis, uh, Botu, Curtis Nosedal uh, paper uh, that the gradients are, um, uh, bounded by uh, the gradients of the individual loss functions uh, have the variance that is bounded in a particular way. Uh, we know that by selecting a sufficiently large batch size, we can get exactly what we want. So here is the formula for the batch size and it depends on M. 
and the probability delta. So if we still, if we given particular M and given particular delta, we can implement this oracle for any M and any delta just by picking the sufficiently large batch size. Here, precisely because we assume that the, uh, the, we have unbiased estimates, we can implement this uh, oracle for arbitrarily small delta and for arbitrarily small M, and we can get this uh, accuracy. And the cost of the oracle also comes directly in terms of cost of number of samples that we need in the batch. So this is immediately available to us. Okay, so this is the first one. Uh, uh, now, if we look at the same <clears throat> uh, basically situation, except for we um, uh, actually our loss is a zero one loss instead of uh, say logistic loss or some nice loss function that we typically use. Uh, the situation becomes bad, and in particular, we're not able to make this assumption anymore. So it's not really true that the gradient estimate is unbiased and, and even has a bounded variance. Uh, and so this is a, a situation that is, you know, we kind of know that it happens in machine learning, but it happens in many other cases as well. Um, and it is something we should look at because the expected risk minimization, expected risk, is this function phi, which often is very nice and smooth and can have actually very good behavior. And this is ultimately what we want to optimize. When we're reporting, you know, numerical results of our machine learning algorithm, we are reporting the testing error, which is really the this phi function. But we never optimize phi. And the reason we don't optimize is because the gradient is completely useless. So if we look at the approximation of phi that we get from just um, you know averaging things on a mini batch, the function that we have is very uh, is basically what's you know drawn here. Uh, it's the stepwise function. So while the function value approximation is actually fairly good, uh, the uh, the gradient approximation is completely useless because the gradients are just zero or non-existent all the time. So the is quite useless, but the function value is not. So you do have an approximation of zeroth order, just not of the first order in this term. So it, 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 this comes from the assumption of how we're computing the, the gradient approximation. It doesn't mean that we cannot approximate the gradients. It's just that the way we would do it by just taking the mini batch and averaging the gradient of the loss is wrong, right? And so this kind of oracle basically is going to be uh, a very bad beast. This is the basilisk and you really don't want to deal with it. It's just basically kills you on sight. So we don't want to do things like this. Okay. So what can we do instead? Instead, we can use zero order information, which as we said, is actually pretty good to construct a different first order oracle. And the very straightforward way of doing this is finite differences, right? We'll, we'll talk about why it may not be the ideal choice, but, but let's start with that. So if you have finite difference approximation, so there's four finite differences and central finite differences. And I assume that most people in the audience know what finite difference gradient approximation is. Um, so if my function values are uh, basically stochastic, but uh, not too far off. And so my assumption here is that somehow I've computed a bunch of uh, zeroth order approximations, zeroth order oracle calls, and they're all within some kind of error of the true function then the first order oracle that I'm going to get is going to be basically like this. In the case of the forward finite difference and in the case of um, uh, the, the central finite difference is going to be here. Okay. Essentially what I'm getting is that, uh, so the sigma, which is the radius of sampling, has to be somehow balanced between the error that we have and what we're trying to achieve. So here I'm going to get a biased gradient estimate. It's never going to be unbiased. And this bias can be controlled by choosing sigma 
small enough, but not too small. So if you choose sigma very small, then this term is, first term is going to be small, but this term is going to explode. So I have to choose sigma that is basically in between. And really, it's just the order of square root of epsilon that is the best for the forward finite differences. And slightly different, it's like the third root of epsilon squared in the uh, central finite difference. And then immediately, I have the uh, everything I need to know about my oracle. My oracle cost is n plus 1. Uh, first order oracle cost is n plus 1 zeroth order oracle uh, calls. And the m for which I can implement this is essentially any m that is greater or equal than uh, this uh, lower bound. right? So I cannot implement for arbitrarily small m, but I can implement it for uh, m above this error bound. And the, and the, the probability is, uh, of success is 1. So delta is essentially 0 because, well, actually, that's not exactly true because it depends on the probability of uh, this condition holding here, right? How likely am I to be to have a accurate oracle? Sorry, I'm <laughs> erasing things here. Too. I mean, I'm covering things here too much, but you understand the idea. OK. All right, so let's see how that actually works. Oh, sorry. Uh, the uh, just associated um, stochastic so fantastic beast that I chose for this is the owl because it is uh, a super reliable. It may not be the most powerful or the strongest or the fastest beast, but it's very reliable. And you know what you're going to get with it. OK, so let's see how it works. Uh, so here I'm actually going to look at a sigmoid uh, because sigmoid is a very interesting function and specifically it's used to approximate the step function that I showed you before. And the step function, as I said, like will have basically nasty gradients, I mean, totally useless, but it will give us good function approximations. So see here I'm going to use sigmoid. And uh, the sigmoid actually depends on the parameter here. So there's parameter A, which controls how steep is the sigmoid uh, step is. So as A gets bigger, it looks more and more like a step function. And when A is small, uh, things behave quite well. So what I'm plotting on the right, so on the left is the true kind of sigmoid for different A's. And what I'm plotting on the right is I chose A equal 1. And then I produced kind of the stochastic approximation. So instead of uh, the particular x, I uh, kind of compute the um, approximation of the sigmoid function by varying x as the normal distribution uh, around it. And uh, you can see that basically the function is still has a nice approximation, and the gradient here in blue and in black are computed by two different means. One is by averaging the uh, the actual gradient of the sigma. Um, and uh, the black one is the finite for forward finite difference gradient approximation. And they're both, you know, approximate gradient pretty well. OK, and maybe forward finite difference is a bit more noisy. But if I change my A, and use a equal to 100, I think. Uh, yes. Uh, you can see the picture actually changes. The function itself is still has good approximation. And the forward finite difference has give us good, good approximation. But the gradient, blue gradient, which is the gradient approximation using averaging gradients, is all over the place. And so that basically indicates that the variance is high. And when the variance is high, as we have seen and discussed, it affects the performance of the algorithms. So the algorithms may slow down. So all of a sudden, computing gradient approximation via forward finite differences may not be such a bad idea, even if there is an alternative to that. OK. So why not then do forward finite difference all the time? Uh, well, you've noticed that it requires quite a lot of function evaluations, right? We, we need to call the zero order oracle n plus 1 times or 2n times if we're doing central uh, finite differences. And, and the, uh, basically, this cost <coughs> is expensive. 
So can we compute these things at lower costs by, again, using zero-sorter information? Because uh, I'm claiming that zero-sorter information sometimes can be better, uh, not just because the, the, the first-order information is not available, but because even though it's available, it has high variance and therefore may slow down the algorithm. Okay, so there is this wonderful uh, um, concept of randomized finite differences, and uh, it probably you know has been introduced in prior literature, but it became popularized at least by the analysis in Nestor Spokoini paper and a few years ago. Uh, and the idea is that instead of uh, doing finite difference in basically coordinate directions, I'm going to choose direction at random, maybe coming from a normal, uh, from the standard normal distribution or standard Gaussian. I'm going to direct uh, compute this direction at random, and I'm going to compute the directional derivative along this direction. And because this direction is random, I have myself a stochastic gradient. And this stochastic gradient is not exactly unbiased, but is a good approximation, almost unbiased approximation of the true gradient. Okay. Uh, and so if I start using it as the gradient direction, I only compute one uh, function value at a time, uh, basically one uh, function values on each iteration, and I can make progress. So in our recent paper uh, with my uh, co-authors, we have analyzed the variance of this, uh, these approximations. And basically, we show that we can put, for example, from this variance analysis, we can generate exactly the first order oracles that we may want. So here I have um, the bounds, right, basically. So this is my M. Uh, and this is my probability. So I can I can generate the first order oracle for any M that is essentially bigger than this, because here uh, M is these three terms, and the last term depends on the number of samples I use. And as number of samples goes to infinity, I can make this last term to be arbitrarily small. So again, I'm computing biased estimates similarly to the finite differences. Um, and I can estimate the cost of, the, uh, of this oracle. Sorry, this actually has to be, should be capital N, not, uh, the, um, not the small n here. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll try to draw capital N, but it's going to be difficult. <laughs> um, so that's the number of samples. However, essentially, uh, what this means, look at the, uh, this term here. What is capital N? Uh, so if you want this term to be small, this capital N actually has to be of the order of little n, at least. Uh, it depends on the size of the gradient, basically. The smaller this, the gradient, the, the smaller we want this last term to be, in a sense. And uh, so essentially, we, we need, it turns out that um, we, if we want the variance to be small, we need the number of uh, samples here to be as, uh, to be comparable to little n. And little n is the dimension. So essentially, this, if you want, so this is the bottom line for this algorithm. If you want this algorithm, uh, you can use it to work, you, you can use it with any arbitrarily small capital N number of samples. But in that case, your variance would be larger, and your step size is going to be shorter. So it's not actually clear if you're going to win anything in the end. So, so far, I haven't seen the evidence of uh, its winning. So the, um, the fantastic beast I associate with this is the centaur, which uh, basically, uh, in a Harry Potter series, the centaurs are these creatures that give out information that is very hard useful used of because um, people who ask the questions don't really cannot really use the answers or understand them okay uh, so the um, one particular favorite of mine is an alternative is linear interpolation it is better than uh, forward finite uh, difference in the sense that 
it does not have to measure the gradient kind of estimate along coordinates. So it can uh, accommodate any uh, n plus one sample points. And that gives it a lot of flexibility, which you can use in an algorithm such as model-based derivative free algorithm that some of you may have seen. Um, but uh, unlike the randomized uh, finite differences, it still relies on n plus one sample points, and it, is, it gives us a very accurate gradient estimate in most cases. Uh, so it basically does not have variance. It has a bias, but it has no variance. So it gives us a good um, gradient estimate. And uh, because I like this uh, particular um, you know, first order oracle, uh, I associated with the unicorn, which is, um, you know, the most magical, uh, best creature one can think of. Okay. So here I just have some uh, empirical evidence that what we observe in theory when I say that the variance grows and you don't get very good approximations, it is actually true. Uh, so I don't want to spend too much time on this, but basically we've tried a very simple two-dimensional function. And if you, what calls Gaussian smoothing and smear smoothing is basically randomized finite difference with the direction generated random Gaussian or, or randomly on a unit sphere. And the function is very nice and two-dimensional, but uh, the evidence shows us we do need to sample quite a lot to actually get anything sensible out of uh, the uh, randomized finite difference. Okay. And the similar thing uh, just for larger dimensions. So if I extend this function to arbitrarily large dimensions, I can, um, you know, estimate gradients. In that case, I cannot plot them anymore, but I can estimate them and compare them to true gradients. And you can see that interpolation and finite differences actually recover pretty good accuracy in the gradients. Whereas the randomized uh, forward and finite differences, even with the same budget, even given the same number of points, actually do a lot of work, a lot worse. So we give all of these algorithms the same budget number of function values, and they still, uh, so the randomized still do worse. So again, uh, it is important to take into account the variance of your first order estimates because then they do affect the performance of the algorithm. Okay, and now to my final, final example, uh, which we're just starting to work on, and it's very interesting, uh, in my opinion. So um, basically, there's been a very significant interest and effort in optimization, policy optimization for reinforcement learning. And it's a very complicated uh, beast, if you want. And really, I think it should be understood depending on the setting and should be analyzed depending on the setting. And here I have a very, very simple uh, setting, which still requires a lot of understanding, which we don't have. Uh, and though the, the picture looks complex, it's really just a very, very uh, simple 2Q system. Uh, so it's an, basically a model in an emergency room with two Qs, one for triage and one for treatment. And the patients come into triage queue at a certain rate and get service. Uh, whenever there's a nurse available, for example. And then once they get service, some of them may go home, but some of them will be processed towards the treatment queue. And uh, if we get to the treatment queue, then they get treated there by a nurse. And again, they, you know, then they may be discharged or they may continue into the hospital admitted. But uh, our purpose is to somehow treat these two queues. And the idea is that we have a finite number of servers finite number of nurses, and the policy here is given the length of Q1 and Q2, where should the next nurse go? As soon as the nurse becomes free, should uh, they go to the, to the Q1 on the Q2? Okay, so very simple question, very specific, has been studied in queuing theory in various ways, uh, but we're gonna treat it as a policy optimization problem. And for that, we need to present the policy. So policies in general, zero, one, right? Go to one queue or the other. But we can present it as a probability distribution. Um, and basically, 
so the, the pi of x is uh, a function, and here we chose again the sigmoid because it's a very good function, and it basically is between 0 and 1. So uh, if it's closer to 1, we have a high probability of prioritizing triage Q, for example. If it's closer to 0, we prioritize treatment Q. And what we're trying to optimize is some kind of average reward over a certain sequence of time periods. So we're computing, this is an expectation, so expected reward, we measure this function, we can only compute it via simulation, we can simulate the process over t times period, collect the reward function, and this would be our uh, approximation of the objective function that we're trying to optimize. Now the choice of this reward function is a question by itself, is an important question, but um, essentially this is how the policy optimization would work. And um, if you write out uh, the gradients and the function value, there is such a thing as policy gradients. And it is a very convoluted and complicated way of looking at basically how to compute, approximate the gradients of um, this uh, reward functions. And essentially, it relies on the fact that the reward function itself is a black box. We cannot compute it. But the uh, the function pi as a function of x, that is policy, as a function of parameterization of our policy is actually a well-known and well-understood sigmoid function. So if you put these two things together, so it's kind of like a gray box optimization, in, but inverse of that. So we have a black box sitting on top of a white box, which is pi. And we use that fact and we compute, uh, you know, some gradient approximation which happens to be an unbiased, as far as I understand, gradient approximation, but it is actually super noisy. Is it? And it's well-known fact that uh, the gradient policy gradients tend to be noisy. And the expression here kind of makes gives us some ideas why it would be a noisy gradient approximation. So the, this is first order oracle has very large variance. The zeroth order oracle, however, does not. And so far, we don't actually have a strong theoretical explanation, uh, but we have some empirical evidence. So, so far, this particular uh, first order oracle, uh, we, you know, associate with the dragon because it's pretty scary and pretty difficult to deal with. And indeed, our uh, numerical results here show, for example, that, uh, so here's the variance in the log scale of the actual reward function itself. Sorry, no, uh, the finite difference gradient approximation versus policy gradient. So if we again employ finite difference gradient approximation, although they are kind of expensive, they are much less noisy than the ones um, uh, computed by policy gradients. Okay, so indeed one has to be careful. Uh, and uh, okay, so more stochastic oracles can be con are being considered by us and can be considered by you or anybody else. Uh, whether they're as scary as these beasts, I'm not sure. Uh, I think it's very useful to look at different stochastic oracles and understand their behavior and their properties, um, and then uh, be able to use them in algorithms. And uh, basically, the conclusions are that, yes, the stochastic oracles uh, are more complex than just empirical risk minimization. The variance and the um, bias affect directly the convergence rate and the neighborhood of convergence. And we can actually understand this by, you know, analyzing what they are. And to understand what the bias is and the variance, we should put them together into the definition of the oracles. And that we need some kind of unified definitions. I suggested some, but it doesn't have to be the the, the only one. Uh, and uh, here are a couple of papers of the algorithms and analysis where we use stochastic oracles, but not exactly the ones I proposed. Uh, and uh, there will be probably more work on this to come later. And I thank you. Thank you so much for the very nice presentation. Um, I will open now the floor for questions from the audience. And again, we do in a similar way as with uh, Emmanuel. So uh, please uh, raise your hand, and I will we will unmute you. 
Yes, so we have a question from uh, Nagisa. Hi. So um, you are now. Yeah, go ahead. Ah, yes, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, my question is like, uh, not really like uh, on the topic, but I was thinking you mentioned the line search in a very fast part. And uh, I was wondering, can we incorporate the noisy function evaluation in the context of line search? Or in the line mm -hmm. search, we have to use the exact function value. No, no, no. That, 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 right. OK, yeah. That's exactly the motivation for this work that I'm talking about. So this this um, first paper here uh, on the uh -huh. slide is, is is exactly line search oh, for see. both noisy and, stoch and, and the stochastic and even biased function uh, evaluations, right? Uh -huh. So you can so incorporate. The, mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes. So the gradient, like a step side step direction, can be noisy and like and uh, right. kind of yes. Uh -huh. Yes. That's, so both the gradient know. and function, both uh -huh. the gradient and function values are noisy, uh, uh -huh. and what you'll see is that the gradient actually can be more noisy than the function values. The function values can kind of carry that burden, it, essentially mm -hmm. because um, yeah, I mean the, the, the right. So anyway, the, the function values have to be more accurate than the gradient, but uh -huh. precisely because the gradient may be actually uh, uh, naturally more noisy, right? It has higher variance then you may naturally have better uh, function values than the gradient approximation. Yep. Ah, thanks. I'm going to read the paper. Thanks. Sure. It's on archive. Well, oh, you see. Thank you very much. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, Leonardo. Hi, do you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. we can. OK. Um, yeah, so my question is also related to line search in the uh, stochastic regime. So I've seen a couple of works. I'm also working on those. Uh, this one is from um, uh, the Mila Research Institute. I've read also yours. So I was wondering, do in some of yours, I don't remember which one, you are uh, requiring to recompute the old gradients, um, mm -hmm. basically for averaging them. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, why do you actually need that? I haven't gone through the proof, if you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So so we, okay, that's a good point. So in that sense, yeah, we one shouldn't probably call this algorithm exactly a line search because traditionally you're right line search is you compute the gradient once and then you basically backtrack the step size until you have sufficient reduction right now yeah. in general in a stochastic gradient uh, the, the the step direction that you've computed may not be descent it may not be pointing the, down the function now, there, there is work, yeah, there's a called stochastic line search from uh, Mark Schmidt's group, where yeah. uh, they do that, right, and they backtrack because basically um, they backtrack using the function values on this mini batch, okay, uh, only on this mini batch. So they always guarantee that eventually they'll stop, but the assumptions have to be much stronger. And also, I think it's a waste of effort, right? So, so the... The assumptions have to be much stronger because you have to assume that whatever you're optimizing or like whatever you've computed that gradient is somehow a descent direction to some nice smooth function that you're computing in your by your function values. And so because otherwise your line search will fail. We don't assume any of this. We're just saying, OK, we have a, a direction that may not be descent. And so as soon as I'm failed with one line search, I'm going to recompute because I might have computed something really lousy there. And the reason basically we're doing this is because like, yeah, if I had a lousy direction, I should better not spend time trying to backtrack on it. I, I just will like toss it out and do something new. But just in case it wasn't a lousy direction, I do need to shrink my uh, step size. So there's a balance there. 
<laughs> and, uh, and and then basically we can yeah we can show all the nice behavior with only assuming that the true function is smooth, but assuming really much less about the actual individual first order oracles. Yeah, I, I think they assume interpolation. That's uh, way stronger than your that, case. That, that's a whole other thing, right? That's a whole that's that's on top of that. Yeah. They also assume interpolation, but in but yeah. they also assume that individual functions are Lipschitz smooth with Lipschitz constants, which ah, yes. again we don't. Okay, that's also another difference. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yes. Thanks a lot. Okay. Is there any other question from the audience? Yeah, I think probably um, that's it. Um, so, Katya, thank you very much for coming today. Um, you, you, you have gathered a lot of attention from a, a very uh, selective audience. It has been a, a pleasure to see uh, you here today. And for the audience, okay. uh, thank you very much for coming today and then uh, see you uh, maybe next week. Yeah, so we, you know that we are running uh, this online seminar series until uh, December 20. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much, you. Katja. It has been very, very interesting. Very beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.